The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to worship on this Lord's Day, this fifth Sunday in the season of Lent. We're so glad to have you with us in joining your presence with us, but also your participation with us as we worship together. Continuing our journey in this Lenten season, I do want to uh, extend the invitation for you to join us on Wednesday evenings as our youth lead us in worship uh, as we continue along our sacred journey uh, toward Holy Week and Easter. And then next week, Holy Week, we will be having a Monday Thursday service that is presented, hosted and presented by our college ministry, the Ukirk Ministry of the College of Worcester. It will be at six o'clock and it will be a Zoom worship. So you tune in at six o'clock through the Zoom link and join us. We will be celebrating communion that evening as well. So that is something you can put on your calendar and uh, prepare your communion elements uh, ahead of time. The next day, Good Friday, we will be having a Good Friday tenebrae service, service of darkness, at 12 noon, and that will be a live, in-person worship here in the sanctuary, and also live-streamed at 12 noon. The live stream will be recorded for YouTube, so you will be able to listen to it uh, later on that day or another day, if you wish. And then we look to Easter morning. We will have a pre-recorded Easter service that will go live at our usual time of 8 a.m. But I do want to extend the warmest invitation to you to come into our church building, into the sanctuary, and be present here for an in-person Easter service, our first one uh, since we had to shut down back last September. The service will um, have seating here in the sanctuary and overflow seating in Brew Hall and the parlor where this service will be live streamed. Again, we will be celebrating a joyful communion together and the start of what I hope for all of us is a new year. A new year celebrated in joy, in hope, in expectation. So do plan to put those uh, times and dates on the calendar. All the links will be on the website, so you may find them there. And our weekly Sunday fellowship service, uh, fellowship opportunity continues, uh, hosted by Mark Gooch. And that uh, link for that, that Zoom link for that, you can find in our weekly news flash. With all of that said, let us now prepare our hearts to worship God. The pandemic has stretched the church in many ways, but we are still very much here. Although it was surely hard at first, we've expanded our thinking and our doing in new and innovative ways to close the distance, to be together. We've continued to worship, to build community, and we've continued to take care of one another. And on top of all of that, we've continued to come together to serve those in need, both in your communities and all over the world, through participation in special offerings and shared mission. Despite the difficulty and the struggle and the loss, the church continues to declare its presence in the world, though different and through different means, but toward the same purpose. The church has found her life and vitality in a bevy of different places too, online, in parking lots, on social media, and even on the phone. This reminds us that the church has always existed beyond the doors of the building. Although we value our community and our time together, and we surely miss those bonds when we are physically far apart, the plain fact is that the church is not the building. Scripture reminds us time and again that God's people belong with those in need, releasing people from the bonds of injustice and with the hungry whom we are called to welcome into our homes, as Isaiah's 58th chapter puts it. The church finds itself with those who are thirsty, imprisoned, suffering illness, as Jesus says in Matthew 25. When did we see you? When did we see you? In a time of need, in a time of weakness, 
in a time of hunger, in a time of thirst, even without a pandemic, it is a truth, a reminder that in every time and in every season, the church finds itself and its savior through relationships with those in need. We belong in this place, not just to help address those needs, though that is surely part of it. We belong there also because it is through relationships with those whom we see experiencing hunger, oppression, thirst, imprisonment, or illness, we might be transformed too. As we become, experience, create, live the church together. One Great Hour of Sharing is the largest way Presbyterians come together to do mission and ministry with those whom we see are in need. Through these gifts, we declare that the church belongs with people whom we see suffering from the terrors of howling winds and natural disasters. Those from whom we see COVID-19 took futures and livelihoods and the whole cultures and communities threatened as a result. The church finds itself with those who, whom we see are thirsty because there are too few water wells and with those who are thirsty because of a lack of political will and a failure of powers and principalities to act in order to secure safe water for everyone. The church belongs as always and forever with those struggling for justice, righteousness, and peace. We give to one great hour of sharing because of where the church belongs, of who the church is. Please give generously to one great hour of sharing so that our church will to continue to become, as Isaiah said, repairers of the breach alongside those experiencing such great need. For when we all do a little, it adds up to a lot. Let us pray. Savior, do not meet us where we are, but find us where you are instead with those experiencing injustice hunger, thirst, and great need. Amen. Good morning. The music for this fifth Sunday of Lent comes from the two great German masters of the Baroque period, George Friedrich Handel and Johann Sebastian Bach. It just so happens that today on the calendar marks Bach's 236th birthday anniversary, so most of the music today was written by him. First of all, we have a violin sonata movement, a larghetto uh, by George Friedrich Handel. Our violinist, Tom Wood, is professor of music at the College of Worcester, and it's a great pleasure to have him back playing for us this morning. The anthem today by our, our choral scholars is the very well-known Yesu Joy of Man's Desiring. You may notice the text is a more modern English translation and certainly a more personal one than you may be familiar with from the traditional Catherine Winkworth translation. The postlude today is uh, a famous toccata or prelude in this case by J.S. Bach, his Dorian toccata. This is a great uh, piece of instrumental music for our particular instrument. You'll see that Bach focuses on the contrast between two manuals of the organ, uh, the Hauptwerk, or the main section of the organ, and the Ruch Positiv, the little division that sits on the rail here at First Pres. So this piece is a great showpiece for that particular aspect of our fine instrument here. In addition to all that, there's a bonus track today, should you wish to uh, take a look at it. It follows the postlude. It's a piano organ duet, which was arranged from a sonata originally for flute and clavier. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you.
I invite you to join me in our call to worship. When our faith is lifted high and we move firmly in your love, you will be our God and we will be your people. When the pilgrimage is long and all our paths seem to lead to nowhere, you will be our God and we will be your people. When the way ahead is clear and we are surrounded by faithful community, you will be our God and we will be your people. Gather us, know us, teach us, lead us, write your name upon our hearts, O God, as we strive to be your people and worship you this day. Let us pray. Gracious God, you are as close to us as our own heart beats. Even when we run from you, you still draw close to us. In this time of worship, help us to remember your never-ending love, your boundless grace, and the new beginnings you offer us time and again. Amen. Please pray with me our prayer of confession and then pray silently. O heart which seeks your own, we yearn for your presence in our lives, yet turn away from you time and again. We want to serve others, but become obsessed with our own desires. We need your hopeful word to fill our emptiness, yet let it be silenced by the noise in our world. God of ancient promises and new covenants, write large upon our hearts the promise of forgiveness, which makes us new people. Engrave our spirits with your grace so we may share hope with all we meet. Etch your compassion upon our hands so we may serve the world as did your servant Jesus, in whose way we seek to walk. Gracious God, hear our prayers. Amen. A new heart, a generous spirit, a fresh start. These are the gifts our God has given to us. We are cleansed, we are healed, we become new people. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please turn to those around you and offer a gesture of peace. The peace of Christ be with you, and also with you. Hello to all our church family. Our children's message today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 45 and 46. Jesus was telling special stories called parables. This is one of them. What makes you happy? Sometimes people think if they own a lot of things, they will be happy. But Jesus wanted people to think differently. So Jesus told them the story of a man who owned many things. There was a merchant, a jeweler, who spent his days looking for pearls. He was very good at his job. He selected only the finest pearls to sell. How many pearls had he seen? Hundreds, maybe even thousands. One day, he saw a pearl that was so different, he gasped, oh, how amazing. Before him was the most beautiful pearl, but it was very expensive. What did he do? The merchant did something very unusual. He went home, he sold everything that he owned, then he purchased that one pearl. The merchant had nothing else to sell, but he had found this most beautiful pearl. The merchant had decided what to keep and what to get rid of. Jesus told this parable, Josie and Jocelyn, because he wanted people to think about what they really need to live as God's people. Josie, Josie, and Jocelyn. And Josie and Jocelyn, guess what? I brought what we like to play with in the summer. And can we find the most special pearl, the black pearl? Open them up. First find, open some of them. Open them up. Open this one up. Is it in there? White pearl. We're going to keep looking. You might have found it. Nope. White pearl. That means it's in here. Okay, let's see. Is it the most special pearl? Let's look at it together. It is. It's, let's take it out. 
It's the black pearl. Jocelyn holds it for a minute and then Josie. That was a very special pearl. What do you think God asked us to have as our most special pearls? How about love? Love. And kindness? Yes, and working hard and loving everybody and mommy and daddy and all our family. Let's pray. Can we pray together? Dear God, you call us to follow you. Help us to give up things that distract us from loving each other and loving you. Amen. At this time in our worship, I invite you to pray with me a prayer written by James S. Lowry and adapted from his collection, Prayers for the Lord's Day, Hope for the Exiles. Let us pray. God of mercy and grace, you have spoken in a loud voice and in a voice still and small. Listen now in these days of reflection, not to the deserving of our voices shouted, but to the yearning of our hearts as they whisper. God of wisdom and of grace, by the Spirit of Christ, your word echoes in the unity of this scattered people. As we examine our place in the order of being, listen not to the logic of our cases argued, but to the hope of our belief that you are listening. Bathed in that hope, we pray for the church, O God. In our prayers for the church, we long for the days, more now than a year gone by, when we could be together, laugh, pray, and sing together, smile, hug, and weep together, as well as butt our heads together. Give us grace to reclaim the good of that memory and wisdom to meet the challenges of this day. The world is more complex now, as is the act of living in and as the church. As a congregation of your scattered people, keep us dreaming. We want to be a united voice of truth, a beacon of justice, a balm of healing, a sanctuary of justice, a people of nurture where children are seen as signs of your kingdom, where noble ideas are fostered in the days of our youth, where faithfulness is encouraged among grown-ups, where the wisdom of long years is cherished, and where truth is demanded in high places. Come, Holy Spirit of Christ, move among us that in these days, when it is so easy not to be the church, that we might be your brave and faithful people, united in love, though separate in space. Not for the church alone, O God, but in this day of self-examination, we pray for our nation and the world as well. We hear on all sides voices filled with anger born of fear and voices of fear born of anger as sides are chosen in blind rage. We are grateful then for leaders who long in quiet strength to do your will. Fill them with grace and right conviction to foster patience, understanding, healing, and above all, truth. We recognize around the world in pictures we see nightly people whose lives are shattered by war, famine, and disease, by natural disaster, corruption, and shameless greed. Show us ways in which we, every one of us, can be signs and means of your healing, even as we speak with the voice of prophets demanding that our leaders see and do the healing thing. And now, hear again the prayers we so often speak for those who grieve and those who comfort them, for those who are anxious and those who steady them, for those who are lonely and those who befriend them, for those who are tired 
and those who share their load. For those who are confused and those who point the way. For those who are addicted and those who love them. For those who are guilty and those who forgive them. And yes, oh yes, a thousand times yes, in these days of unspeakable disease, we pray for those who are desperately ill and those who attend them, for those who are dying alone and the nurses who hold their hands, for those who are quarantined and those who phone them, for those who are out of work and those who feed them, for those who are not in school and those who teach them, for those who tirelessly seek prevention and cure, and for all of us who are grateful to them. As always, we close our prayer humbly asking that you give us grace as those who are called to be answers to these, our earnest prayers. We pray in the name of the one who, without ceasing, prays for us especially for us, especially for everyone. And in closing, we are bold to join our voices and pray together the ancient prayer we have been taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our reading today is from Psalm 51, a prayer for cleansing and pardon. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sin, and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take away your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Here we are, right in the middle of Lent and time to think of ourselves and of our relationship to God. This has often been a quiet time, a time of contemplation, a time to be self-critical. This can be a useful time in our spiritual life. After all, we need to take stock of who we are and of what we are doing with our lives and how we might live in a way that will draw us closer to God. This can be a dark and painful time, but it doesn't have to be. In fact, it can be a positive time, a renewing time, a time to see our relationship with God as it is and to rejoice in the chance to make it stronger. With the snow melting and the green beginning to show, we are beginning to feel anew also. So many quotes for inspiration of spring are out there, but I've always loved where flowers bloom, so does hope. We celebrate the new year in January during the coldest and darkest time of the year. For me, it seems out of place and not a very hopeful or inspiring time. When I was a graduate student one spring, I was invited to a New Year's party. The party was for the Persian New Year, and it was all about spring. A new year as the earth is bringing forth new life. It seemed a perfect match. Most of the decorations for the new year were plant-centered, and on every table there were tiny seedlings reaching forward. So simple, yet so inspiring. The Persian New Year begins on March 19th this year, this year. Perhaps we should celebrate. And what would we celebrate? The slowing of this awful virus, the end of winter, the hope for economic improvement, the return to schools, the reopening of restaurants and other special places we've missed this long and painful year. Here at First Presbyterian Church Worcester, we are beginning to feel the excitement of joining together in person for worship. It won't look the same, but it will be so much better than looking at a computer screen. Scripture tells us that we are given a chance of new life through our relationship to God. In 1 Peter, the apostle writes, Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. New birth into the new year. After all, the dates are only on paper. In Helen Hunt Jackson's poem, New Year's Morn, she encourages us to see each new day as a start to a new year. Only a night from old to new, only a sleep from night to morn. The new is but the old come true. Each sunrise sees a new year born. The Persian New Year is March 19th. Let's celebrate. But what do we see when we look back at the old year? Like many people, I've been looking at pictures from images of last year, and I look in horror 
at groups of people standing close together, sometimes shoulder to shoulder with people they don't know. People sitting at restaurants close enough to reach to the next table for the delicious dessert. Of people dancing, singing, hugging, cheering. And I know how much we have changed. The casual innocence has been replaced with caution, with fear, with isolation, and with loneliness. But even worse is the anger we feel towards one another as we navigate this change. And we all know it hasn't been pretty. The anger over mask wearing, the great economic division in our country where a few got richer while many lost their jobs, their homes, their health, and sometimes their loved ones. We face the ugliest election and aftermath our country has ever witnessed and that will scar us for decades to come. And the death toll has been enormous. Over 500,000 people have died. More than all of World's War I and II and the Vietnam War combined. It has been a painful year and we long for recovery. And now, here we are, waiting for Easter waiting for the joy of new life. How can we get from where we are to where we want to be by Easter Sunday? Scripture can help us. For although this is a new time for us, the ancient text can lead us. In Romans, we read, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and encouragement for the scriptures, we may have hope. We can turn to the prophet Isaiah who writes, forget the former things and do not dwell in the past. I will do new things. Do you not perceive it? Be inspired. We can move forward in our spiritual lives. And then we must forgive, which is the very basis of Christianity. I wrote this thinking of forgiving others and my list is quite long. Those who did not follow the required precautions, putting others at risk. Those who made life worse for those around them. And all those little but painful things that hurt me. Thoughtless comments, unsupportive friends or colleagues. Even the person who has the library book that I want to read and has never returned it. I could go on, and I'm sure you could also. But it is time to let go. It is time to let live, and it is time to move forward. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, he writes, there is but one thing I encourage you to do, forgetting what is behind you, straining towards what is ahead. When we read from the book of Romans, we read, accept one another, just as Christ accepted you. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Jesus Christ. If we are honest with ourselves, there is plenty of forgiving on all sides, and Lent is a good time to ask for forgiveness as well as to forgive. We must also look at ourselves. I'm reminded of the old adage, the road to hell is paved with good intentions because I meant to do better, and I meant to be better. We must forgive ourselves as we move closer to Easter. Next week is Palm Sunday, and then Easter will be here, and we will join again in person. Let us join with grace-filled hearts, knowing that we are forgiven, and that we can forgive. Let us come together with peaceful hearts, knowing that we have the gift of eternal love. And let us join with joyful hearts, knowing that God's love will always sustain us. I hope to see you soon. Amen.
And now I leave you with scripture from the book of Hebrews. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur on one another towards love and good deeds. Let us encourage one another all the more as you see the day is approaching. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.